In 2007, Warner Bros. Home Entertainment began to distribute a series of direct-to-video animated superhero films based on the characters and stories of DC Comics. These films were usually stand-alone projects either as adaptations of popular works or as original stories. This concept was updated into a shared movie universe in 2013 with Justice League The Flashpoint Paradox and Justice League War. I have already covered those movies and their source material in previous videos, but for a quick summary, those movies set up a more New 52-influenced movie universe. Today's video will be about an older animated movie from 2009, which was based on the first six issues of the Superman Batman monthly comic book series, kickstarted by Jeff Loeb and Dedrick McGuinness. This comic book series explored the camaraderie, antagonism and friendship between the characters. One example of this was in a dual narrator technique between Superman and Batman, in presenting their opposing viewpoints and how they saw each other when working together. This movie does not have that, and it's one of the many reasons why these animated movies are overrated in my opinion. Like with the Flashpoint Paradox and Justice League War after it, Superman Batman Public Enemies was adapted from a pre-existing source material, but unlike those movies, the adaptation dropped the ball so hard that it can literally be called one step forward and two steps back. Let me explain by going through the first six issues of the source material, and then explain how this movie ended up as a meh footnote among the animated DC direct-to-video films. Why is it the good villains never die? What the hell are good villains? Before we begin, there are two things that I need to bring up. Number one, back in 2003 when the Superman Batman comic book series started, the DC Universe was going through the post-Zero Hour world state, in which the identity of the killer of Bruce Wayne's parents was never caught or identified. This was changed two to three years later in Infinite Crisis, where Joe Schill was once again confirmed as the killer, but in this story it could have been anyone. Number two, in the year 2000, at the same time as the Bush v. Gore presidential election, DC Comics made their own story, where Lex Luthor became the third candidate and won the presidency, relatively fair and square. Nothing about cheating was ever confirmed or denied, or it could have been the result of SCP-4444, but otherwise even Superman accepted Luthor as the new president of the United States. By 2003, Luthor was near the end of his first term in being a rather good president, with his ambitions and intelligence being directed away from his antagonism against Superman and towards more progressive activities. Moving on, the trade graphic novel I have opens first with a two pages long short story drawn by Tim Sale that has nothing to do with the story. It is essentially a this happened and didn't lead to anywhere thing. Issue number one. As the first issue of the 87 issues long run, plus five annuals, the story begins with a re-thread of Superman and Batman's origin stories with that dual narration from both commenting on them. Then the story finally begins with Superman flying around Metropolis and responding to Metallo, the John Gorman version, breaking into Star Labs. They fight as newsfeed in the background has Lex Luthor announcing the beginning of his re-election campaign as the President of the United States, and then Metallo throws a tantrum when Superman damages a human skin shell, and then runs away, leaving Superman to wonder what he was looking for at Star Labs. Later Superman joins Batman at a graveyard in Gotham, where multiple graves have been opened and desecrated by Metallo. Superman shares with Batman that Metallo's original remains as John Corbin were buried in the graveyard, according to the intel from Star Labs, and that before being turned into an android with a kryptonite heart, Corbin used to live in Gotham. Metallo then appears, announcing that he has discovered his human remains and that he doesn't want to fight them. But Batman initiates the fight anyway by attacking Metallo as another criminal to apprehend. Metallo, however, pushes Batman away from him and then makes him busy by shooting Superman with a kryptonite bullet. Batman temporarily neutralizes Metallo with plastic explosives and dives into the open grave Superman fell into to dry dig out the kryptonite bullet. While they banter as Batman tries to keep Superman lucid and not pass out, Metallo picks himself back up and buries them both alive by filling the open grave. While this was happening, President Luthor is being briefed in Pentagon about the kryptonite asteroid the size of Brazil on a collision course with Earth, 
and tells his trusted team of superpowered people that this information is confidential. Issue number two. Batman uses a mini explosive to get him and Superman from the grave to the sewer system, where they make their way to the Batcave. There, Alfred, with his superior medical skills, manages to remove the kryptonite bullet from Superman's body. While that was happening, Batman went to refresh his knowledge on metal and came to realize that Corbin had lived in Gotham when Bruce's parents were killed. Being the right age, Batman suspects that Superman must have known that metal was likely a suspect on his parents' deaths, but their argument is cut short by the arrival of an older Superman. This older Superman attacks Superman and Batman while ranting about them being responsible for multiple deaths in the future, and that he has traveled back in time to kill them to save those who died. While they fight, President Luthor tries to deal with the kryptonite asteroid by teleporting missiles at it, but it doesn't stop the asteroid from keeping its course towards Earth. The older Superman then beats his younger self when he suggests that they take their fight elsewhere, and then moves to on to stop Batman from getting the kryptonite ring from the vault. Batman is stripped of his utility belt and almost crushed under a Batmobile, until Superman reaches back to the med bay and uses Alfred's hunting rifle to shoot the kryptonite bullet removed from him at his older self, causing him to disappear. But not before leaving them with a warning of not to make the same mistake with Luthor, who, following his failed attempt to stop the asteroid, then decides to address his fellow Americans by telling them that there is a kryptonite asteroid on its way to collide with Earth and it's all Superman's fault. Anyone who brings him down will be rewarded one billion dollars. Superman and Batman react to this with a challenge accepted no. attitude. Issue number three. Superman and Batman decide to crash an interview President Luthor is giving to Lois Lane, who at this point was already married to Clark Kent and knew he was Superman at the White House. But on their way there, they are attacked by Silver Banshee, Mr. Freeze, Captain Cold, Icicle, Killer Frost, Mangle, Solomon Grundy, Lady Shiva, Nightshade, Gorilla Grodd, and a shitload of other villains who want that money. And then Captain Adam, Major Force, Power Girl, Black Lightning, Green Lantern, John Stewart, Katana, and Starfire arrive to beat those wannabe bounty hunters and try to arrest them instead. Issue number four. Superman and Batman then have to fight their fellow heroes and Major Force, who unleashes his nuclear powers after getting pissed off. Superman uses his flight and speed to contain it, while also giving Batman the needed distraction to use the Justice League teleporter to get them, along with Power Girl and Katana, teleported across the world to Tokyo in Japan. President Luthor is reported about this while he is taking steroids and committing a HR violation, to which he pretty much responds with, I don't care if they are no longer in American soil. Go commit an international incident. In Tokyo, Batman and Katana talk to as former Outsiders team members about someone in Japan who can help them with the kryptonite asteroid, while Power Girl tells Superman which of the heroes in their team can be trusted. Then Captain Adam and the other picks left back in Washington attack them in Tokyo, and Katana responds to Major Voice attack by cutting his hands, which causes him to go nuclear. Superman has Green Lantern contain Major Force, while Starfire and Black Lightning draw as much of his released energy to themselves. Batman on his end convinces Captain Adam to absorb the rest of Major Force's explosive energy that Starfire and Black Lightning can't. Just before doing so, Captain Adam makes an only guilty men run plea to Superman, and ultimately Major Force's nuclear explosion is contained to an evacuated crossroads. This knocks the opposing players out, with Captain Adam having disappeared, and with Superman, Batman, Power Girl and Katana moving to Mount Fuji. With Captain Adam's team failing to capture and losing members to the deflectors, President Luthor assigns the capture mission to the Justice Society of America, whose chairman Mr. Terrific assigns it to Hawkman and Zazam, who was still called Captain Marvel back in 2003. Those two attack Superman and Batman at Mount Fuji, and ignore Power Girl and Katana, who move on to their target that I'll get to eventually. Long story short, Superman and Batman fight Hawkman and Sazam on the mountains while switching opponents, but ultimately get both taken down surprisingly easily. Superman by not realizing that Hawkman has magical weapons, and Batman by letting his guard down when Sazam switches to Billy Batson and back. Issue 5. Sometime later. President Luthor has announced to the country about Superman's capture, with Batman as his accomplice. This causes Superman's allies and the Bat family to raid the White House. 
Superboy Connor Kent, Natasha Iron Steel, and Crypto the Superdog with a prototype Supergirl that no one remembers anymore, engage with Secret Service and get contained in tight spaces. Meanwhile, Nightwing, Tim Drake's Robin, Cassandra Kane's Batgirl, and Huntress break into the Oval Office to learn from President Luthor that the announcement of Superman and Batman's capture was made too early. They are not in custody, and Luthor then plays time by negotiating to make the Oval Office fill with a nerve agent that he has taken the immunization shot for already. And that is pretty much why he is able to one-shot Huntress and Cassandra Kane's Batgirl faster than they can react, while Robin just snoozes off. Nightwing doesn't go down without a fight, or a bitch is that all you got smirk, and in the desolate future, Captain Adam meets up with the older Superman from issue 2. And another long story short, Superman and Batman overpowered Hawkman and Shazam off screen and disguised themselves as them. They did this so that Power Girl and Katana could approach the Japanese Toy Man about the solution to the Kryptonite asteroid, and so they could come to tell Luthor to stop acting like he wants to get impeached. Then they get the word to get back to Japan and leave President Luthor ecstatically offended for being ignored. Issue number 6. Superman and Batman return to Mount Fuji in Japan to meet up with Hiro Okamura, the Japanese toy man, who introduces them to his ultimate solution to deal with the Kryptonite asteroid. Which at this point of the story has reached that near of Earth that Superman can feel it. This solution being a composite Superman-Batman spaceship that is supposed to fly and collide with the Kryptonite asteroid, destroying it before it hits Earth. The ship is already in countdown with Superman volunteering to fly it, under delirium of the asteroid's weakening effects, but at the 2 minute mark, Captain Atom appears similarly as the older Superman did in issue number 2. He uses Batman's kryptonite ring to knock Superman out and then explains to Batman that destroying the asteroid is not enough as the radiation from it would still be present. So, Captain Atom explains why he has to be the one to fly the spaceship to destroy the asteroid so he can absorb the kryptonite radiation, just like how he did with Major Force. He returns Batman's kryptonite ring to him and flies the ship to space, while Superman and Batman go to respond to how Luthor is going to make sure his presidency will be remembered just like with Joe Biden once Kamala takes over. Superman flies in to confront Luthor in a physical confrontation now that he is wearing his power armor. As they fight, Luthor rants about how he has finally made the world see Superman the way he does because he believes that the kryptonite asteroid is on its direct course to Earth because of him. Superman is dumbfounded on how Luthor can be this delusional, to which Luthor cites Darkseid as his source of information and new armor. At this point, Superman has had enough of Luthor's bullshit and punches him through three buildings while Captain Atom breaches the asteroid and neutralizes it while giving a speech. Luthor lands into his old Lexcorp building, which he had left in charge of Talia al Ghul when he moved to the White House, who, as Batman's baby mama, then sold it all to Bruce Wayne. Batman tells Luthor to get out of the now Wayne Enterprises building to which Luthor responds by stabbing him, and asks Batman why he is not looking into John Corbin's possible connection to the Wayne shooting as a mystery more worthy of his time. Batman however sees through it as a falsified evidence meant to distract him from helping Superman, and Luthor escapes by jumping out of the window with a boom tube that causes the former LexCorp building to get cut in half. Superman comes to save Batman from the crumbling building as the Kryptonite asteroids remains fall to Earth in smaller and safer pieces, with Captain Adam presumed dead and Vice President Pete Ross sworn in Luthor's place as the President of the United States. The end. So, that was the original story that came out in 2003, and it was basically meant as the ending of Lex Luthor's presidency. Which, to be honest, wouldn't have needed to be written this harshly in antagonizing him, since his presidency wasn't the cartoonish reign of terror it could have been. When Luthor's priorities were in the White House, he actually got to put his intelligence into a better use than just hating Superman for the sake of it. It was also suggested that Luthor did not exactly serve the entire four-year term, but he was close to its completion since the beginning of the story has him talking about his re-election campaign. However, once he fails to deal with the asteroid instead of going forward with other contingencies, Luthor drops all subtleties and skips over to blaming Superman for it. 
And if the ending is to be believed, Luthor was planning to let the asteroid hit Earth anyway since he had arranged Metal as a possible distraction to keep Batman from helping Superman. The future Superman was also something of a far reach addition to the story, but was justified in the end with Captain Atom being the one who flew the rocket into space and destroying the asteroid while also absorbing its radiation. So far, I think the story was chosen to be this because of the 2004 presidential elections were about to happen after it, with DC and Jeff Lowe wanting to clean up the White House in case George W. Bush got voted out of there. And DC probably also wanted to change the status quo by making Luthor a straight up villain again for future stories. Story-wise, Superman Batman Public Enemies was written well enough with a mix of waterfall and agile methods, where Jeff Loeb knew where the story was going and needed to do some changes while getting to the end. This is why the cliffhanger of issue 4 and the entirety of issue 5 can come across as needless filler, that Loeb decided to fill in with fanservice cameos. Along with Metallo walking away from the story in issue 1, being mentioned and forgotten in issue 2, and then finally being reminded of with the confirmation that he was only a red herring in issue 6. Okay, and now to the adaptation. So, unlike the comic where Luthor was near the end of his first term as the president, the movie begins with Luthor becoming the President of the United States and having his inauguration speech have Captain Atom's team introduced as his personal superpower team. Which does not include John Stewart's Green Lantern because they probably realized John to be too smart to be a part of it. Since we are no longer in the post-zero hour continuity, Metallo is no longer a possible suspect in the Wayne shootings and is made a member of the Secret Service. Instead of looking for his human remains, he fights Superman in a graveyard because President Luthor brought him as insurance to meet with Superman, and tensions between all three causes a scene to happen. This was one of those one step forward and two steps back examples because Luthor and Superman had a discussion about how to deal with the asteroid, and it was also called correctly a meteor in the movie. The meteor's pure kryptonite, a chunk of krypton the size of a small country. They never spoke like this in the comic, and it was said there that if they had, then things might have gone differently. But since they now had that conversation, the movie decided to make it go wrong on purpose and keep the plot rolling. Metallo's use of lethal force to shoot Superman with a kryptonite bullet also comes across as strange, since he was not emotionally compromised in looking for his human remains and being hunted as a criminal. The movie then has him be killed off by major force under Luthor's orders to frame Superman for it, to explain his absence in the story to be addressed. The future Superman is also cut out of the movie altogether, so Superman and Batman are not distracted from Luthor's attempts to stop the meteor, and only learn about it after the fact when Luthor announces Superman as responsible for the video. Except that instead of that, Luthor tells the American people that the massive kryptonite meteor is affecting Superman's mind, despite being of the green variety instead of the other colors that can actually do that. The strongest divergence from the source material comes when Captain Atom's team confronts Superman and Batman in Washington, and instead of fleeing to Japan, aka away from their jurisdiction, they just go one state away to Metropolis in Delaware, aka stay on American soil, with just Power Girl who gives them a poor justification on why she doesn't trust President Luthor. Now that you've been up close and personal with Luthor, how do you feel about him? He makes my skin crawl. Major Force blows up again, but without Captain Atom Quantum leaping into the future to meet the future Superman in a desolate future and telling him how to deal with the meteor. Because the future Superman was cut out of the film. Cutting out the Japan part of the film also took away the build up for the Japanese Toy Man who is just vaguely brought up near the end before Superman and Batman go to him. The White House detour was also changed to having them disguise themselves as Hawkman and Zazan, 
to infiltrate a military complex for intel. So, no bad family, superboy steal and crypt to superdog cameos in the film. Since Captain Atom never quantum leaped into the future and came back with future knowledge, that Intel was written to have the composite Superman Batman rocket be first remote controlled at the right speeds to hit the meteor with better results than the previous missiles. But then Luthor shows up to the Japanese toy man's Yisho in Mount Fuji and destroys the remote controls, so Captain Atom's role in flying the rocket is given to Batman instead. Because this was 2009, Batman still had his plot armor and there is zero tension in him flying the rocket being a suicide mission. And that is why it hit harder on emotional level when the rocket was flown by Captain Adam instead. Without Darkseid's intel and the Apocalypse upgrades to his power armor, Luthor just decides to let the meteor hit Earth so he can rebuild society in his image, after he fails to destroy the meteor on his first try. He is then beaten by Superman and arrested by Captain Adam when he comes back to his demoted role in the film later. The kryptonite meteor's radiation is then somehow ignored when Superman flies to his fragments to bring Batman in his escape capsule back to Earth from space and... <sighs> what a boring lackluster of an adaptation. It tried, but was held back by the 67 minutes long runtime, which was how long these early animated movies were. So far, the animation style matched up with Ed McGuinness's art style, although it was a little more restrained, and that along with the voice cast was pretty much what had this movie standing on its own. Having Tim Daly, Kevin Conroy and Clancy Brown voicing Superman, Batman and Lex Luthor was an obvious nostalgia move, but when comparing the movie to its source material, I'll go with the comic being the obvious better version of the story. Their performances deserved better material where just reading the comic into an audiobook would have been better than this. Especially when there were scenes in it that I would have wanted to hear being read by Daly, Conroy and Brown that were never adapted to the animated movie. Such as the future Superman's first appearance in the Batcave, Batman's confrontation with Luthor in the abandoned LexCorp building, and Captain Adam's speech in his final moments before saving Earth from the meteor. A year later in 2010, Warner Bros. Home Entertainment released a follow-up movie adapting issues 8 through 13, which introduced a new version of Karazor L's Supergirl into the post-crisis continuity. This Superman Batman Apocalypse movie did the exact same mistakes by diverging from the plot at one point and made what were originally powerful ending scenes fall flat, just like the adaptation of Superman Batman Public Enemies. I will go over them in a future video, as it is time to end this one. Give me likes on the work I put here, comment what opinions you have on the comic and the animated movie, share this video to grow my audience, and subscribe for future videos. If I could get a community tab, I could interact with all of you better. Also, ding the bell for when I start streaming some video games, and may your heart be a guiding key.